The Little Book of Eternal Wisdom Part 2 Chapter 6 How deceitful the love of this world is, and how amiable God is. Servant Sweetest good, if I leave thee but a little, I am like a young roe which has strayed from its dam, and is pursued by the hunter, and runs wildly about, until it escapes back to its cover. Lord, I flee, I run to thee with ardent desire, like a stag to the living waters. Lord, one little hour without thee is a whole year. To be estranged one day from thee is as much as a thousand years to a loving heart. Therefore, thou branch of salvation, thou sprig of May, thou red-blooming rose-tree, open and spread out the green branches of thy divine nature. Lord, thy countenance is so full of graciousness, thy mouth so full of living words, thy whole carriage such a pure mirror of all discipline and meekness. O thou aspect of graciousness to all the saints, how very blessed is he who is found worthy of thy sweet espousals! Eternal Wisdom Many are called to them, but few are chosen. The Servant Gentle Lord, either they have broken with thee, or thou with them. Eternal Wisdom Lift up, therefore, thy eyes, and behold this vision. The servant lifted up his eyes, and was terrified, and with a deep sigh said, Woe to me, dear Lord, that I, that ever I was born! Do I see aright, or is it only a dream? I saw thee before, in such richness of beauty, and such tenderness of love. Now I see nothing but a poor, outcast, miserable pilgrim who stands wretchedly leaning on his staff before an old, decayed city. The trenches are in ruins, the walls falling down. Only that, here and there, the high tops of the old timber work still project aloft, and in the city is a great multitude of people. Among them are many that look like wild beasts in human form. And the miserable pilgrim who goes wandering about to see if any one will take him by the hand. Alas, I behold the multitude, drive him with insult away, and hardly look at him because of the things about which they are busy. And yet some, but only a very few, offer to give him their hands. This the other wild beasts come and prevent. Now I hear the miserable pilgrim begin to sigh woefully and cry aloud, O oh, heaven and earth have pity on me, me who have garnered up this city with such bitter toil, and who am so badly welcomed in it while those who have spent no labor upon it are set so kindly received. Lord, such is what has been shown me in this vision. O thou eternal God, what does it mean? Am I right or wrong? Eternal Wisdom This vision is a vision of pure truth. Hearken to a lamentable thing. O oh, let it touch thy heart with pity. I am the miserable pilgrim whom thou didst see. At one time I was in great honor in that city, but now I am brought down to great misery and driven out. The servant, dearest Lord, what is this city? What are the people in it? Eternal Wisdom This decayed city is an image of that spiritual life in which I was once so worthily served. And while they were living in it so holily and securely, 
it begins in many places to fall very much to ruin. The trenches begin to decay, and the walls to crack, that is to say, devout obedience, voluntary poverty, secluded purity in, it, in holy simplicity, begin to disappear, and, at last, to such a degree that nothing is to be seen standing, except the high timber work of mere exterior observance. As to the great multitude, the beasts in human form, they are worldly hearts under spiritual disguises, who, in the vain pursuit of transitory things, drive me out of their souls. That a few should, nevertheless, offer to give me their hands, but they are hindered by the rest, signifies that some men of good intentions and devout feelings are perverted by the speech and evil example of others. The staff on which thou did see me stand leaning is the cross of my bitter passion, with which I admonish them at all times to think on my sufferings, and to turn, with the love of their hearts, to me alone. But the cry of misery that thou didst hear is my death, which even here begins to cry aloud, and ever cries aloud, because of those in whom neither my unfathomable love nor my bitter death is able to do so much as to expel the worm of sinful thoughts from their hearts. The Servant O oh Lord, how it cuts through my very heart and soul to think thou art so lovable, and yet, in spite of it all, are in so many hearts so utterly despised. Ah, tender Lord, what will thy advances be to those who, though they see thee in the miserable shape in which thou art rejected by the multitude, yet stretch out their hands to thee with sincere faith and love. Eternal Wisdom Those who for my sake give up perishable affections, and receive me with sincere faith and love, and remain constant to the end, will I espouse with my divine love and sweetness, and will give them my hand in death and exalt them on the throne of my glory before the whole court of heaven. The Servant Lord, there be many who think they will still love thee without giving up perishable love. Lord, they will needs be very dear to thee, and yet it is not less indulge in temporal love. Eternal Wisdom It is as impossible as to compress the heavens together and enclose them in a nutshell. Such persons array themselves in fair words. They build upon the wind and construct upon the rainbow. How may the eternal abide with the temporal when even one temporal thing neither can nor will endure another? He but deceives himself who thinks he can lodge the king of kings in a common inn, or thrust him into the mean dwelling of a servant. In entire seclusion from all creatures must he keep himself, who is desirous of receiving his guest as he thought. The Servant Alas, sweet lord, how completely bewitched they must be all! Be not to see this. Eternal Wisdom They stand in deep blindness. They endure many a hard struggle for pleasures, which yet neither fix their attachment nor afford them full gratification. Before they obtain one joy they meet with ten sorrows, and the more they pursue their lusts, the more are these upbraided with being insufficient. Lo, godless hearts must needs be at all times in fear and trembling. 
Even the fleeting pleasure they obtain proves very harsh to them, for they procure it with much toil. They enjoy it in great anxiety and lose it with much bitterness. The world is full of untruth, falsehood, and inconstancy. When profit is at an end, friendship is at an end. And, to speak shortly, neither true love nor entire joy nor constant peace of mind was ever obtained by any heart from creatures. The Servant Alas, dear Lord, what a lamentable thing it is that so many a noble soul, so many a languishing heart, so many an image formed after God in such a beauty and sweetness, that in thy espousals ought to be queens and empresses, powerful in heaven and on earth, should so foolishly go astray and degrade themselves. Oh, wonder of wonders, to think of their own accord, they should be lost. According, uh, since, according to thy words of truth, the fell separation of the soul from the body were better for them than that thou, the life eternal, shouldst have to separate from their souls where thou findest no dwelling place. O oh, ye dull fools! Behold how your great ruin prospers, how your great loss increases, how you allow the precious, the fair, the delightsome moments to pass away, which ye may hardly or indeed never again possess, and how gaily you carry yourselves the while, as though it concerned you not. Alas, thou gentle wisdom, did they but know it and feel it surely, they would desist. Eternal Wisdom Listen to a wonderful and lamentable thing. They know it and feel it at all hours, yet do not desist. They know it and yet will not know it. They beautify it like an unsound argument, with dazzling brightness, yet which is unlike the naked truth, as so many of them at last, when it is too late, will have to feel. Alas, tender wisdom, how senseless they are, or what does it mean? Eternal wisdom, here will they needs escape calamity and suffering, and yet fall into the midst of it. And as they will not endure the eternal good and my sweet yoke, they will be overwhelmed by the inevitable doom of my severe justice with many a heavy burden. They fear the frost and fall into the snow. The Servant Alas! tender and merciful wisdom, remember that, without being strengthened by th thee, no one can accompany anything. I see no other help for them than to raise their eyes to thee, and to fall at thy feet with bitter, heartfelt tears, entreating that thou wouldst vouchsafe to enlighten them and free them from the bonds which they are made fast eternal wisdom. I am at all times ready to help them, if only they be ready. I do not turn away from them. The Servant Lord, it is painful for love to separate from love. Eternal wisdom Very true. If I could not and would not lovingly make good all love in hearts of love, the servant. O oh God, is it impossible to leave off old custom? Eternal Wisdom. But it will not be yet more impossible to endure future torments. 
the servant. They are perhaps so well regulated in themselves that it does them no injury. Eternal Wisdom I was the best regulated, and yet the most self-mortified. How may that be regulated which, from its very nature, corrupts the heart, confuses the mind, perverts discipline, draws off the heart from all fervor, and robs it of its peace. It breaks open the gates, behind which godly living lies hidden, that is, the five senses. It robs sobriety and introduces audaciousness, the loss of grace, the estrangement from God, the interior tepidity, and exterior sloth. Lord, they do not think they are hindered so much, if only what they love have the appearance of a spiritual life. Eternal Wisdom A clear-seeing eye may just as easily be blinded by white meal as by pale ashes. Behold, was ever any person's presence so harmless as mine among the disciples? No unprofitable words fell from us. Amongst us there was no extravagant demeanor, no beginning loftily in the spirit and sinking down in the depth of endless words. There was nothing else but real earnestness and my entire truth without any deceit. And yet my bodily presence had to be withdrawn from them before they became susceptible of my spirit. What a hindrance, then, must not a merely human presence prove. Before they are initiated by one person, they are seduced by a thousand. Before they are reformed in one point by good precept, they are often led astray by bad example. And, to speak briefly, as the sharp frost in May nips the blossoms and scatters them abroad, so the love of perishable things blinds godly seriousness and religious discipline. If thou hast still a doubt respecting it, look around thee into the beautiful, fruitful vineyards which formerly were so, so delightful in their first bloom, how utterly withered and ruined they are, so that they contain few traces more of fervent seriousness and a great devotion. Now, this produces an irreparable injury, for it has become a thing of habit, a spiritual decorum, which, secretly, is so destructive of all spiritual salvation. It is all the more pernicious as it appears innocent. How many a precious spice garden is there, which, adorned with delightful gifts, was a heavenly paradise, where God was well pleased to dwell, which, now, by reason of perishable love, has become a garden of wild weeds, where lilies and roses formerly grew, now stand thorns, nettles, and briars, and where angels were used to dwell, swine now root up the soil. Woe betide the hour, and when all lost time, when all good works neglected, shall be reckoned up, when every idle word spoken, thought, written, whether in secret or in public, shall be read up before God and the whole world, and its meaning, without disguise, be understood. The Servant Alas, Lord, these words are so sharp that indeed it must be a stony heart that is not moved by them. Ah, my Lord, some things there are, of so tender a nature, that they are much sooner attracted by love than by fear. And as Thou, the Lord of nature, 
art not a destroyer but a fulfiller of nature. O, oh, therefore, most kind and gracious Lord, put an end to this sad discourse, and tell me how thou thou art a mother of beautiful love, and how sweet thy love is. Chapter 7 How Lovely God Is The Servant Lord, let me reflect on that divine passage where thou speakest of thyself in the book of wisdom. Come over to me, all ye that desire me, and be filled with my fruits. I am the mother of fair love. My spirit is sweet above honey and the honeycomb. Wine and music rejoice the heart, but the love of wisdom is above them both. Ah, Lord, thou canst show thyself so lovely and so tender, that all hearts must needs languish for thee and endure. For thy sake, all the misery of tender desire, Thy words of love flow so sweetly out of thy sweet mouth, and so powerfully affect many hearts in their blooming days, that perishable love is wholly extinguished in them. O oh, my dear Lord, this it is for which my soul sighs, this it is which makes my spirit sad. This it is about which I would gladly hear thee speak. Now then, my only elected comforter, speak one little word to my soul, to thy poor handmaid. For lo, I am fallen softly asleep beneath thy shadow, and my heart watcheth. Eternal Wisdom, listen then, my son, and see, incline to thee, to me, thy ears, enter wholly into thy interior, and forget thyself in all things. I am in myself the most incomprehensible good, which always was and always is, which never was and never will be uttered. I may indeed give myself to men's hearts and be felt by them, but no tongue can truly express me in words. And yet, when I, the supernatural, immutable good, present myself to every creature according to its capacity to be susceptible of me, I bind the sun's splendor, as it were, in a cloth, and give the spiritual perceptions of me and my sweet love in bodily words thus, I set myself tenderly before the eyes of the heart. Now adorn and clothe thou me in spiritual perceptions, and represent me as delicate and as comely as thy very heart could wish, and bestow on me all those things that can move the heart to a special love and delight of soul. Lo! all and everything that thou and all men can possibly imagine a form of elegance and grace is in me far more ravishing than any one can express and in words like these do i choose to make myself known now listen further i am of high birth of noble race I am the eternal word of the fatherly heart, in which, according to the love abounding abyss of my natural sonship, in his sole paternity, I possess a gratefulness before his tender eyes in the sweet and bright flaming love of the Holy Ghost. I am the throne of delight, so I am the crown of salvation. My eyes were so clear, my mouth so tender my cheeks so radiant and blooming, and all my figure so fair and ravishing, yea, and so delicately formed, that if 
a man were to lie in a glowing furnace till the day of judgment, only to have a single glance at my beauty, he would not deserve it. See, I am so deliciously adorned in garments of light. I am so exquisitely set off with all the blooming colors of living flowers, that all may blossoms, all the beautiful shrubs of dewy fields, all the tender buds of the sunny meads, are but as rough thistles compared to my adornment. In the Godhead I play the game of bliss, such joy the angels find in this, that unto them a thousand years but as one little hour appears. All the heavenly host follow me, entranced by new wonders, and behold me. Their eyes are fixed on mine, their hearts are inclined to me, their minds bent on me without intermission. Happy is he who, in joyous security, shall take me by my beautiful hand, and join in my sweet diversions, and dance forever the, jo the dance of joy, amid the fr ravishing delights of the kingdom of heaven. One little word there spoken by my sweet mouth will far surpass the singing of all the angels, the music of all harps, the harmony of, the, of all sweet strings. My faithfulness is so made to be loved, so lovely I am to be embraced, and so tender for pure languishing souls to kiss, that all hearts ought to break for my possession. I am condescending and full of sympathy, and always present to the pure soul. I abide with her in secret, at table, in bed, in the streets, in the fields. I turn myself whichever way I will, in me there is nothing that can displease, in me is everything that can delight the utmost wishes of my heart and desires of the soul. Lo, I am a good so pure, that he who in his day only gets one drop of me, regards all the pleasures and delights of this world as nothing but bitterness, all its possessions and honors as worthless, and only fit to be cast away. My beloved ones are encompassed by my love, and are absorbed into the one thing alone, without imaged love, and without spoken words, and are taken and infused into that good out of which they flowed. My love can also relieve regenerate hearts from the heavy load of sin and can give a free, pure, and gentle heart, and create a clean conscience. Tell me, what is there in all this world able to outweigh this one thing? For he who gives his heart wholly to me lives joyfully, dies securely, and obtain the kingdom of heaven here as well as hereafter. Now, observe, I have assuredly given thee many words, and yet my beauty has been as little touched by them as the firmament by thy little finger, because no eye has ever seen my beauty, nor ear heard it, neither has it ever entered any heart. Still let what I have said to thee be as a device to show thee the difference between my sweet love and false, perishable love. The Servant Ah, thou tender, delicious wild flower, thou delight of the heart in the embracing arms of the pure loving soul, how familiar is all this to him who has ever really felt thee! But how strange is it to that man who knows thee not, whose heart and mind are still of the body, O oh, thou most heartfelt, incomprehensible good, 
This is a precious hour. This is a sweet moment, in which I must open to thee a secret wound, which my heart still bears from thy sweet love. Lord, plurality in love is like water in the fire. Lord, thou knowest that real fervent love cannot bear duality. Alas, thou only, Lord, of my heart and soul, my, desire, my heart desires that thou should have a particular love for me, and that I should be particularly pleased to thy divine eyes. O oh Lord, thou hast so many hearts that ardently love thee, and are of much account with thee. Alas, my sweet and tender Lord, how stands it with me in this matter? Eternal Wisdom I am a lover of that sort who is not diminished in unity, nor confounded in multiplicity. I am as entirely concerned and occupied with thee alone, with the thought of how I may at all times love thee alone, and fulfill everything that appertains to thee, as though I was wholly disengaged from all other things. The Servant O oh, rare, O oh, wonderful, whither am I born, how am I gone astray? How is my soul utterly dissolved by the sweet friendly words of my beloved? Oh, turn away thy bright eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Whenever there was a heart so hard, a soul so lukewarm, so cold as, when it heard thy sweet living words, so exceedingly fiery as they are, was not fain to melt and kindle in thy sweet love. O wonder of wonders, that he who thus sees thee with the eyes of his soul, should not feel his very heart dissolve in love. How right blessed is he who bears the name of thy spouse, and is so. What sweet consolations and secret tokens of thy love must not be eternally received from thee. O thou sweet virgin Saint Agnes, thou fairer, fair wooer of eternal wisdom, how well couldst thou console thyself with thy dear bridegroom, when thou didst say, His blood has adorned my cheeks with rose color. O gentle Lord, that my soul were but worthy to be called thy wooer, and were it indeed possible that all delights, all joy and love, that this world can afford, might be found united in one man, how gladly would I renounce him for the sake of that name! How blessed is that man, that ever he was born into the world, who is named thy friend, and is so. Oh, if a man had even a thousand lives, he ought to stake them at once for the sake of acquiring thy love. Oh, all ye friends of God, all ye heavenly host, and thou, dear Virgin St. Agnes, help me to pray to him, for never did I rightly know what his love was. Alas, thou heart of mine, Lay aside, put away all sloth, and see if, before thy death, thou mayest advance so far as to feel his sweet love. O thou tender, beautiful wisdom, O my elected one! What a truly right gracious love thou canst be above all loves else in this world! How very different is thy love! and the love of creatures. How false is everything that appears lovely in this world and gives itself out to be something, as soon as one really begins to know it. Lord, wherever I might cast my eyes, I always found something to disgust me. For if it was a fair image, it was void of grace. 
If it was fair and lovely, it had not the true way, or if it had indeed this, still, I always found something, either inwardly or outwardly, which the entire inclination of my heart was secretly opposed. But thou art beauty with infinite affability, thou art grace in shape and form, the word with the way, nobility with virtue, riches with power, interior freedom and exterior brightness, and one thing thou art which I have never found in time, namely, a power and faculty of perfectly satiating every wish and every ardent desire of a truly loving heart. The more one knows thee, the more one loves thee. The more acquainted one is with thee, the more friendly one finds thee. Ah, me! What an unfathomable, entirely pure good thou art! See how deceived all those hearts are that fix their affections on anything else. Ah, ye false lovers, flee far from me, never come near me more. I have chosen for my heart that one only love in which my heart, my soul, my desires, and all my powers can alone be satiated with a love that never dissolves away. O oh Lord, could I but trace thee on my heart, could I but melt thee with characters of gold into the innermost core of my heart and soul, so that thou mightest never be eradicated out of me. O oh, misery and desolation! That ever I should have troubled my heart with such things. What have I gained with all my lovers, but time lost, forfeited words, an empty hand, few good works, and a conscience burdened with infirmity? Slay me, rather, in thy love, O Lord, for from thy feet I will never more be separated. Eternal Wisdom I go forth to meet those who seek me, and I receive with affectionate joy such as desire my love. All that thou canst ever experience of my sweet love in time is but as a little drop in the ocean of my love in eternity. Chapter 8 An Explanation of the Three Things Which, Most of All, Might Be Likely to Be Repugnant to a Loving Heart in God One is, How He Can Appear So Wrathful and Yet Be So Gracious The Servant Three things there are at which I marvel very much. One is, that thou shouldst be beyond all measure so amiable thyself, and yet so severe a judge of evil deeds. Lord, when I reflect on thy severe justice, my heart with compassionate voice exclaims, Woe to all who persist in sin! For they did, for did they but know the strict account of every single sin, which thou wilt infallibly require, even from thy very dearest friends, they ought sooner to pluck out their teeth and hair than ever provoke thy anger. Woe is me! How very terrible is thy angry countenance! How very intolerable thy ungentle averted looks! So full of fire are thy threatening words that they cut through heart and soul. Shield me, O Lord, from thy wrathful countenance, and extend not thy vengeance against me to the next world. Lo, when I only doubt, lest, because of my guilty deeds, thou mayest have turned thy face angrily away from me, it is a thing so insupportable that nothing in all this world is so bitter to me. 
O oh, my Lord and Father, how could my heart endure thy angry countenance forever? When I but seriously reflect on thy countenance inflamed with anger, my soul is so horrified, all my strength is so shaken, that I can liken it to nothing else but the heavens beginning to darken and grow black, to fire raging in the clouds and a mighty thunder rending them, so that the earth trembles, and fiery bolts dart down upon men. Lord, let no one confide in thy silence, for verily thy silence will soon be turned to a dreadful thunder. Lord, the angry countenance of thy fatherly anger to that man who is fearful of provoking and losing thee is a hell above all hells. I will say nothing of that furious countenance of thine which the wicked at the last day will have to behold in bitterness of heart. Woe, everlasting woe, to those who shall have to expect so great a calamity. Lord, all this is a profound mystery to my heart, and yet thou sayest that thou art so gracious and so good. Eternal Wisdom I am the immutable good, and subsist the same, and am th the same. But that I do not appear the same, arises from the difference of those who view me differently, according as they are with or without sin. I am tender and loving in my nature, and yet a terrible judge of evil deeds. I require from my friends childlike awe and confiding love, in order that awe may restrain them from sin, and love unite them to me in faith. Chapter 9 The Second Thing Why God, after rejoicing the heart, often withdraws himself from his friends, by which his true presence is made known. The Servant Lord, all that has been explained to my heart's satisfaction, except one thing. In truth, Lord, when a soul is quite exhausted with yearning after thee, and the sweet caresses of thy presence, then, Lord, Art thou silent, and saying, sayest not a word? O Lord, ought not this to grieve my heart, that thou, my tender Lord, thou who art my only one love, and the sole desire of my heart, shouldst yet behave thyself so strangely, and in such a way hold thy peace? Eternal Wisdom and yet do all creatures cry aloud to me that it is I. The Servant, O oh dear Lord, that is not enough for a languishing soul. Eternal Wisdom, if every little word I utter is a little word of love to their hearts, and every word of the sacred scriptures written by me is a sweet love letter, as though I myself had written it, Ought not this to be enough for them? The Servant O Lord, Thou knowest well that to a loving heart everything that is not its only love and its only consolation is insufficient. Lord, Thou art so very intimate, choice and fathomless a love. Lo, if even all the tongues of all the angels were to address me, Love unfathomable would still pursue and strive after him alone whom it longs for. A loving soul would still take thee for the kingdom of heaven, for surely thou art her heaven. Alas, Lord, mayest I venture to say that thou shouldst be a little more favorable to such poor affectionate hearts as pine and languish for thee? as breathe out so many an unfathomable sigh to thee, 
as look up so yearningly to thee, crying aloud from their very hearts, Return to us, O Lord, and speaking and reasoning with themselves thus, Have we cause to think we have angered him, that he will forsake us? Have we cause to think he will not give us his loving presence back again, so that we may affectionately embrace him with the arms of our hearts, and press him to our bosoms, till all our sorrow vanish? Lord, all this thou knowest and hearest, and yet thou art silent. Eternal Wisdom I know it and see it with heartfelt eager joy. But now, since thy wonder is so great, answer me a question. What is that which, of all things, gives most delight to the highest of created spirits? The Servant Lord, I would fain learn this from thee, for such a question is too great for my understanding. Eternal Wisdom Then I will tell thee. Nothing tastes better to the very highest angel than in all things to do my will, so that if he knew that it would tend to my praise to root up nettles and ever other weeds, it would be for him, of all things, the most desirable to perform. The Servant Ah, Lord, how dost thou strike home to me with this question? For surely thy meaning is that I ought to keep myself disengaged and serene in joy, and seek thy praise alone, both in sorrow and delight. Eternal Wisdom A desertion above all desertion is to be deserted in desertion. The Servant Alas! Lord, but is it a very heavy woe? Eternal Wisdom where is virtue preserved except in adversity? Yet know that I often come and ask for admission into my house, and I am denied. Often I am received like a poor pilgrim, and meanly entertained, and speedily driven out. I come even to my beloved, and fondly take up my abode with her. But it takes place so secretly that it is totally hidden from all men, except those only who live in entire seclusion and perceive my ways, and who are ever careful to correspond to my graces. For in virtue of my divinity I am a perfectly pure essential spirit, I am spiritually received into pure spirits. The Servant Gentle Lord, methinks thou art altogether a hidden lover. Therefore I desire, desire thou wouldst give me some signs of thy true presence. Eternal Wisdom In nothing canst thou discern my presence so well as in this namely when I hide and withdraw myself from the soul, as not till then thou art capable of perceiving who I am and what thou art. I am the eternal good, without which no one has any good. When I, the eternal good, pour myself out so graciously and lovingly, everything into which I enter is made good. By this goodness my presence is to be known, even as is the sun by his brightness, who in his substance is not yet to be seen. If ever thou art sensible of me, enter into thyself and learn to separate the roses from the thorns, and to choose out the flowers from the grass. The Servant Lord, Truly I seek and find in myself a great inequality. When my soul is deserted, she is like a sick person who can relish nothing, who is disgusted with everything. The body is languid, 
the spirits are dull, dryness within, and a sadness without. All that I see and hear is then repugnant to me, and I know not how good it is, for I have lost all discrimination. I am then inclined to sin, weak in resisting my enemies, cold and lukewarm in all that is good. He who visits me finds an empty house, for the master, who gives wise counsel and makes all the family glad at heart, is not at home. But, Lord, when in the midst of my soul the bright morning star rises, all my sorrow passes away, all my darkness is scattered, and laughing cheerfulness appears. Lord, then leaps my heart, then are my spirits gay, then rejoices my soul, then it is my marriage feast, while all that is in me or about me is turned to thy praise. What before was hard, troublesome, and impossible, becomes easy and pleasant, fasting, watching, praying, self-denial, and every sort of rigor, are made sweet by thy presence. Then do I acquire great assurance in many things, which, in my dereliction, I had lost. My soul is then overflowed with clearness, truth, and sweetness, so that she forgets all her toil. My heart can sweetly meditate, my tongue loftily discourse, and whoever seeks high counsel from me, touching his heart's desire, finds it. For then I am as though I had overstepped the bounds of time and space, and stood in the antechamber of eternal salvation. Alas, Lord, who will grant that I might be only of longer duration? For behold, in a moment it is snatched away, and I am again stripped and forsaken. Sometimes I pursue it as if I had never gained it, till at last, after much sorrow and trouble of heart, it comes back. Lord, art thou this thing, or am I it, or what is it? Eternal Wisdom Thou art and hast of thyself nothing but imperfection. I am it, and this is the game of love. The Servant But, Lord, what is the game of love? Eternal Wisdom All the time that love is with love, love does not know how dear love is. But when love separates from love, then only does love feel how dear love was. The Servant Lord, this is a dreary game. Alas, Lord, is the incon inconstancy never cast aside in any one while time lasts? Eternal Wisdom In very few persons, for constant constancy belongs to eternity. The Servant Lord, who are these persons? Eternal Wisdom the very purest of all, and in eternity the most like to God. The Servant Lord, which are they? Eternal Wisdom They are those persons who have denied themselves in the most perfect manner. The Servant Gentle Lord, teach me how, in my perfection, I ought to behave in this matter. Eternal Wisdom In good days thou oughtest to look at evil days, and in evil days not to forget good days. Thus can neither elation injure thee in my company, nor despondency and dereliction. And if in thy faint-heartedness thou canst not endure my absence with pleasure, wait for me at least with patience, and seek me diligently. The servant, O oh Lord, long waiting is painful. Eternal Wisdom 
He who will needs have love in time must know how to bear weal and woe. It is not enough to devote me only a portion of the day. He who, who would enjoy God's intimacy, who would hear his mysterious words and mark their secret meaning, ought always to keep within doors. Alas, how is it that thou always permittest thine eyes to wander so thoughtlessly around, when thou hast standing before thee the blessed and eternal image, which never for a moment turns away from thee? Why dost thou let thy ears escape from thee, when I address thee so many a sweet word? How is it that thou so readily forgettest thyself, when thou art so perfectly encompassed with the eternal good? What is it thy soul seeks in exterior things who carries within her so secretly the kingdom of heaven? The servant. What is the kingdom of heaven, O Lord, and which is in the soul? Eternal wisdom. It is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The servant. Lord, I understand from this discourse that thou hast made much hidden intercourse with the soul, which is wholly hidden from her, and that thou dost secretly attract the soul, and dost leisurely initiate her into the love and knowledge of thy high divinity. Her who at first was only concerned with thy fair humanity.